Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us today for our 13th PATH Live Forum titled Pandemic Proofing Primary Healthcare. My name is Dr. Kimberly Green, and I'm PATH's new director for our primary healthcare program. And I'm delighted to be moderating today's conversation. We'll start first by going over a few logistics. We very much want to hear from you during this conversation. So please share your questions and comments uh, by submitting them uh, through the chat or Q&A box. We'll have some time towards the latter half of the session uh, to take some of the audience, audience's questions. Please also note that this call is being recorded so it can be shared with those who are unable to join us. I see that we have participants joining us from all over the world, government representatives, community organizations and NGOs, donors, as well as private sector partners and others. Thank you for joining us. As an overview for our session today, I'll briefly introduce PATH, then frame primary healthcare within the context of COVID-19. And then we'll move to our panel to discuss the state and future of primary healthcare in light of this pandemic. So I'd now like to welcome our panelists. Uh, we'll have three speakers with us today. First, Dr. Salim Hussein, who's head of Department of Primary Healthcare with the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Tracy McNeil, who is the Director of Health Systems at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and finally, Dr. Monica Ogutu, who is the Executive Director of the Kasumu Medical and Education Trust, otherwise known as KMET who are headquartered in Kisumu and work across Kenya. So a huge thank you to our panelists for joining us today. So now I'd like to share a little bit about PATH for those of you who may be less familiar with us. We are a global team that is dedicated to achieving health equity so all people can thrive. And we work across 70 countries where most of us uh, are from the countries where we work. We work through partnership with governments, community groups, advocates, private sector, academic in institutions, and many others uh, to strengthen uh, integrated primary health care and health systems in ways that meet the most pressing needs and preferences of individuals, families, and communities. Our work spans uh, the development of new health diagnostics, digital solutions and vaccines, supports market shaping for sustainable access to essential health products like oxygen, contraceptives, uh, or HIV self-test kits, responds to emerging health threats like Ebola and COVID, uh, and also fosters co-creation of innovative client-centered service delivery, and much more. Our new Primary healthcare program at PATH includes expertise in health system strengthening, as well as healthcare needs across the lifespan, from maternal newborn child health and nutrition, early childhood development, to HIV and TB and sexual and reproductive health, and non-communicable diseases, and cuts across all technical teams at PATH. At the global level, we advise normative bodies, coordinate multi-stakeholder efforts, and engage in evaluation and research. And like many of you on this call, we're part of global efforts to accelerate COVID-19 vaccine development, delivery, and access. So now I'll turn to framing primary health care in light of COVID-19. So 42 years ago in Alma-Alta, uh, a global commitment was made to primary health care that underscored the need for urgent actions by all governments, healthcare workers, and the world community to protect and promote healthcare for all people. The commitment is, ref is reflected in the World Health Organization's definition of primary healthcare as being a whole of society approach to health and well being that's centered on the needs and preferences of individuals, families, and communities throughout their entire life. Primary healthcare is comprehensive and is focused on addressing the broader determinants of health and interrelated aspects of physical, mental, and social health to prevent disease, promote health, and manage illness. As many of you know, uh, recent global and national events have put primary health care back on the agenda. In particular, the uh, 2018 Declaration of Astana, 
which reaffirmed global commitment to primary health care, making it central to achieving universal health coverage uh, and sustainable development goals. And clearly, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has only underscored the vital importance of integrated, people-centered primary health care. But as we now know, uh, COVID-19 has had a catastrophic impact on health systems, access to care, and health outcomes. But this impact, impact has varied significantly across countries and health areas. With support from the Gates Foundation, we conducted a rapid data analysis of essential health services that are part of primary health care in five countries, comparing data from quarter three in 2019 to the same period in 2020. So not surprisingly, uh, disruptions differed by country, but tended to be most significant for immunization and sick child care services. So in addition, uh, you know, routine tracking by the Global Fund with its partner countries has identified high to moderate disruptions in HIV, TB, and malaria services uh, through the latter half of last year, though there is some recovery in sight. Still, three quarters of countries are experiencing disruptions in HIV and TB services, and more than half in malaria service delivery. So as the pandemic took off in early 2020, there were very rapid efforts in a number of countries to adapt primary healthcare services and policies uh, in order to maintain access to prevention and care. So through support from the Gates Foundation and working together with WHO and USAID and others, we've cataloged, cataloged here some of the most common actions that were taken to improve the safety uh, as well as infection prevention and control within health facilities to optimize access, as well as a suite of options to enable remote healthcare through virtual engagement and telehealth, through home visits or task shifting, uh, and simplifying health services through multi-month scripting, service bundling, and self-care, just to name a few. So now, as we move into 2021, primary healthcare systems and providers around the world are faced with one of the most monumental healthcare challenges ever, effectively, rapidly, and equitably vaccinating all those who want and who are eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine worldwide. There is a lot to be done to fulfill this man mandate to ensure vaccine equity. And this map clearly frames the stark differences that we see now in access across the world uh, and clearly marks uh, the very urgent need for a rapid increase in financing and action. So the COVID-19 pand pandemic has underscored the critical importance of resilient primary health care systems, the world's first and best defense uh, against the spread of infectious diseases. But what have we learned from the pandemic and how can the public health community strengthen primary health care to guard against the next outbreak or the next pandemic? And that leads us to our conversation today. So Tracy, I'd like to start off today's conversation with you. You have vast experience in primary health care from being a registered nurse to uh, helping a large NGO roll out health programs in hard to reach areas around the world, to launching and rolling out a digital health service as part of Rwanda's plan um, to expand universal health coverage. So with all of this experience, why do you think integrated primary health care is so important to building resilient health systems? And what challenges do you see ahead in making good on the Astana Declaration? And then related to that, in your new role at the Gates Foundation, what are your top priorities for overcoming these key challenges? So over to you, Tracy. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Kimberly, and thank you for that great introduction. And also congratulations to PATH for the amazing work you do. Um, and I'd like to say a big hello to um, all the 245 participants that have taken the time to join us today. Um, so, as you know, I'm very new to the foundation. I started at the end of October and my role as Director of Health Systems, so, um, a major part of the work with the team uh, within the foundation is looking at the primary healthcare strategy that we want to have finalised by the end of this year. So, I think, you know, your, your first question is, um, is why is integrated healthcare 
uh, primary health care important. And, and I think, you know, probably Kimberly, I, I think probably the best example I can give of that is um, spending time in, in, in Rwanda where um, I'm an operational person. And actually, when, when you see things come to life and you change the way healthcare is delivered, then um, it's very impactful. And I think when, when I think of integration, I think of um, how digital technology and innovation can really join the dots in the patient journey. And I think that when you look at innovating that patient journey from end to end, then, then I think that you can do something transformational and improve access, make it more sustainable and scalable. So I think, you know, what, what the, the challenges for us working in some of the environments we are is how do you join those dots? And, you know, what, what, what I have seen uh, happen is you can take so much of what happens in a bricks and mortar facility um, and you can transform it on a digital platform. And so with the support of the government in Rwanda and a lot of key stakeholders and even you know, mobile phone operators, what we were able to do was, you know, we, we joined those dots. And what I mean by that is that we did electronic registration and verification. And these were not smartphone users. These were individuals who were largely subsistence farmers who were part of the universal health coverage scheme who had only had access to feature phones. So we did electronic registration and verification. We could then do um, triage on a feature phone. Um, we could do that through voice and data. You could then um, have, and then um, if necessary, you could have a consultation with a healthcare provider. The healthcare providers were in a call center and they had access to an electronic medical record. So you're beginning to build up the patient profile, the patient's history. Um, many of the consultations we could close at that point, but if, if you couldn't, then you can do a, uh, electronic prescribing, um, you can do electronic referral, um, and you can do uh, referral for diagnostics. And actually, when I think about integrated healthcare, I always think of it through the eyes of, of the patient. So, so um, it, 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 in, in my world, but I'm not being gender specific, I tend to think of that, you know, subsistence farmer in a very uh, remote place, um, often a female, often with, with, with many children in, in the field with her. And if you can offer an integrated healthcare delivery service, then actually that person doesn't actually have to leave home or the field or their place of work they can access the care they require on their phone and they only have to walk to the nearest pharmacy if they need e-prescribing. If in the case of it, someone who uh, requires face-to-face -face care, then you can actually fast track them. You can send an e-referral to um, a local health post or a, or a local health facility. So for me, I think we're fortunate to work in the field that we do and have the power of technology in our hands. And I think that, you know, that, that's where I see the vision and, and I know that's the vision of the foundation and why this year is very important for us in pulling together the primary healthcare strategy that we will engage many of you in and, and, and share with you. And then our, our role will be to um, actually work with um, implementers and key stakeholders in terms of that journey of, of transforming primary healthcare. So I think, you know, you, you ask what some of the challenges are I think, you know, many people told me when I went to Rwanda that it wasn't possible. So I think one of the first challenges is you have to believe it's possible. You have to really want to make it happen and you have to work with partners who are, who are like-minded and don't, don't, don't give up at the first hurdle when you come across something that's difficult. So I think, you know, for me, it's about being executional and being focused and working with those who are like-minded um, because it's hard, it's, it isn't easy. I think the other, the other two challenges are scalability and sustainability. So um, I'll be controversial by, by saying this and that I'm not a great fan of pilots. I think so many people do such good work through pilots, but they, they never get past the pilot stage. And I think that, you know, we in the foundation ha have a role with our grantees in terms of, you know, how are we gonna help them become um, sustainable and scalable when we're looking at integrated primary health care and, and I think that they're questions that we'll be asking and supporting grantees and that there's many ways in which we can do that but but I do think you know that the time is right and the time is now in terms of integrated health care and, um, uh, and being scalable and sustainable. 
so, so I guess with, with all that said, what's the priority for uh, the amazing team that um, I work with within the foundation? And, and I think, you know, our, our priority at, at the moment are two or three things. Importantly, is to pull together a primary healthcare strategy that we can share with all of you and that we can walk side by side and, and deliver on and, and be transformational. Obviously, you know, this is a big year for COVID. So many of the teams that I have um, the absolute pleasure and honor to work with are working on COVID tools on COVAX. So um, particularly with uh, working with Oren Levine and, and his team, that, that's a big priority for us um, in the foundation. And then also, you know, we can't forget business as usual. So uh, we've got some key priorities, but we still have a lot of work to do in the foundation in the key priority areas in, in, in which we work. So I hope that's kind of given you a flavor of um, where our thinking is going in the foundation for now and our key priorities and, and some of the challenges. Thank you, that was fantastic, Tracy. So with the challenges that are out there, number one, believe it's possible. No, we can make the change. Number two, move beyond pilot, pilotitis. Uh, and number three, it's you know really around uh, partnerships and using digital technologies to leapfrog so that we can scale. Thank you. Um, Dr. Salim, I'd like to turn to you now as a leader and head of primary health care in Kenya. You have been an unwavering champion for community health workers in Kenya, ensuring they are central to building the national community health strategy. Can you tell us what steps the Ministry of Health has taken to enhance the partic participation of the community, which is so essential in informing what primary health care services need to include and what they need to look like? Uh, and how you've done that before and now how you've adapted during COVID-19. And so for you then also, what have been the greatest challenges or obstacles in creating an integrated primary health care system across uh, all of Kenya? Over to you, Dr. Hussein. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kimberly. I also want uh, first uh, to thank uh, Path for organizing this uh, uh, um, meeting. It's very important for us, especially at this time of uh, COVID. Uh, I also want to thank the participants for availing themselves and uh, participating. Thank you very much. Uh, and also uh, inviting us, uh, more so as uh, uh, health workers or people from the Ministry of Health from Kenya. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in terms of how we have been integrating mainstreaming our community health uh, work and strategy in the system, especially looking at uh, uh, community-based primary health care. Uh, just prior to COVID, uh, the government of Kenya had actually, the president has uh, what we call the uh, big four agenda. And one of the big four agenda is the UHC, universal health uh, coverage. And uh, when we started uh, implementing this, we had uh, a pilot phase where we had a uh, one year, we piloted in four counties. And uh, in these counties, one of the main lessons that was learned after the one year is that uh, the, the orientation that we had being very curative and investing only in the facilities was not working. So we had already started now investing or focusing on primary health care. In fact, our approach, what we have now with the government and within the ministry is a PHC for UHC. We are using PHC as an approach uh, to, to attain uh, UHC. So before COVID uh, came, uh, we were actually tasked to come up with uh, a primary health care strategic framework, which uh, we are happy we launched in July, uh, that is uh, uh, last year. Uh, then we also were told to complete our community health policy, uh, which uh, we did and the launch at the same time. Uh, in terms of documentation, uh, we were now we are only doing the primary health care uh, guidelines, which uh, we think we should, we should finalize uh, very soon. Uh, the uh, primary health care, uh, orientation actually uh, needed a lot of uh, input and resources. And one of the things we were doing is actually we called other sectors, we are calling them uh, enablers because we realized uh, we had not, uh, we, we had actually so, sort of uh, forgotten the primary health care uh, part of uh, the health system. So we needed a lot of enablers. So we had a Ministry of ICT, we had Ministry of Energy, uh, to put electricity to most of the facilities which do not have electricity. Uh, we had the Ministry of Roads uh, to try and at least make possible usable roads uh, to the facilities. Uh, we even brought in a Ministry of Water. So we have these uh, other sectors that are coming. And directly uh, at the Ministry of Health, uh, under UHC, 
we are actually looking at all the building blocks. We have uh, recruited uh, personnel, health care workers uh, for the facilities. We have actually uh, currently reached 97% uh, community health units coverage in, in, in Kenya. Uh, that means uh, we have about 95,000 community health volunteers currently who have been oriented. And this started uh, during the UHC uh, period. Uh, we actually, uh, we had moved uh, up to 2019 uh, to a coverage of uh, about 65% of community health workers in the country. Uh, in terms of community health uh, strategy uh, directly, uh, we actually now had established most of the community health units. Uh, we were trying to operationalize the same. In the primary health care, the biggest orientation of the different things that we are looking at currently in Kenya uh, is uh, coming up with what we are calling uh, the uh, primary health care networks. And in these networks, we are looking at having uh, multi-sectoral uh, teams that can work together from level four, uh, which are uh, some of our referral facilities, to level three, level two, and up to level one, where we have the community health units directly linked uh, to the link, uh, health facilities and the communities. So this was uh, before COVID. Uh, during COVID, uh, we were happy to uh, fast track some of the things that we had started, and uh, we, we can say that COVID in a way, uh, despite some of the challenges, it uh, forced us to, to, to do things differently. Uh, for example, where we were at 65% community health unit, but by July last year, we had to complete 100% community health units. Uh, primary health care uh, networks, we have already started now in different counties where we are setting up this community uh, primary health care network. Uh, in terms of uh, resources at different level in infrastructure, we have been strengthening level two and level three, which for a long time have been neglected. So currently, uh, we want them to equip them with some basic uh, equ radiological equipment so that people do not go to the higher levels, radiological and laboratory uh, equipment so that people do not go to the higher levels. We have also, as I alluded earlier, we have put uh, some human uh, resource in the same. So I can say during COVID, we have managed to strengthen uh, the community health system, if I can call it. and. Uh, uh, currently, uh, we are still looking at just operationalizing of the same. Also, during the COVID, uh, we managed to come with different documents because as it was shown uh, by the statistics that health uh, surface, essential health services had gone down. So we came up with several documents. For example, we came up with a community health implementation in the contents of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we also came with the primary health care guidelines during the uh, COVID pandemic. So COVID has also forced us to come up with the different uh, documentation implementation so that we can uh, enhance or go back to the essential services that had gone down. So during COVID, despite its challenges, uh, we have managed to do uh, several things that are actually strengthening our primary health care uh, system. Uh, some of the challenges that we are facing, I think it's a big, or uh, trying to orient people differently. It's been a big challenge. Most of us, the health workers, even the communities, we are very curative uh, focused. Uh, you'll find that the communities will go to the higher levels uh, just for, uh, uh, for services at the higher levels because it is curative. You'll find that most of our health workers are not focusing on preventive and promotive health. It has been a challenge. Coming up with a multidisciplinary team, which we want them to focus to go out and give services to the people, not wait for sick people, to go and give uh, health services that will maintain the people to be healthy and to prevent diseases. It has been a, a big challenge. I think the other challenge also uh, for us, a technology, despite that it helped us in some way, it was also one of our challenge. There was a lot of myths. There was a lot of uh, uh, misconception going around uh, the social media, uh, which we had to deal with. Uh, so we can say uh, uh, technology in some way also uh, gave us a, a bit of challenge. Uh, during this orientation, I think uh, we are trying uh, to change that perception. I think the other challenge, because we know <clears throat> most of the economic uh, empowerment that went down because people lost jobs, uh, people uh, when they were working, they could not work. So the people could not afford the services. So there was the fear of the COVID, but there was also the accessibility or inaccessibility due to financial constraint. <clears throat> Those were some of the, uh, the challenges that uh, we really experienced. Thank you, over. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, 
Kenya in so many ways is the blueprint for primary health care. You've talked about how you do multi-sectoral engagement and you've practically shown how that happens and why that's so critical to ensure a stable access to energy, to water uh, and so many other critical components to maintain access to care. Um, you've also talked about how COVID forced you to do things differently. You know, Kenya is widely recognized for putting in place very quick policies to enable community-based delivery of health services. Uh, and I want to recognize you for that. A lot of your policies have been adapted and used in other countries. Uh, but also the challenges uh, coming with digital tools with misinformation and how that's, uh, that can be a barrier and so critical to manage and get ahead of. So thank you. So I'd uh, now like to move to Monica. Monica, you are a frontline healthcare worker and a phenomenal health advocate, particularly among populations that have greater challenges in seeking primary care, like adolescents, youth, and key populations. So as a leader working in Kenya at the community level, as well as the policy level, bringing citizens and civil society voices to the decision-making tables, can you share some of the greatest systems and policy challenges that you and your staff have seen during COVID-19? Over to you. Thank you, Kim. And uh, first, I also want to echo, I want to thank uh, Pat for putting this together. It's a great moment now to just pause, reflect and re-strategize. So thank you very much. And as you've heard from my colleague, my colleague Salim from Nairobi, um, there is a lot happening in Kenya, and I'm based in, uh, in Kisumu, which is uh, one of the 47 counties in Kenya, and it happens that Kisumu was also the pilot uh, county for UHC. So a lot was going on just before COVID hit us, and this disrupted everything. And some of the, uh, the issues that we had to deal with as we talk about PHC, there are still those communities, especially the vulnerable communities, informal settlements in Kisumu that don't even have the basics. So when there were guidelines, COVID guidelines, uh, really reinforcing the need to wash hands, uh, to social distance, and to mask, there are those families that totally didn't have anything. So those are some of the things we had to, first of all, start uh, grappling with. And you can't go to a community, start telling them, wash your hands, and they don't have water. And some of these uh, families have lost their jobs because as you are aware, COVID was very disruptive. Everything came down. They had lost their jobs, schools are closed, children are at home, they are buying water, they don't have the basics. Some of them uh, don't even have money for masks and you are telling them every time you get out, you need to, to mask. So some of those things we had to prioritize. So one thing that we did as an organization, really working closely with the, with the county government was to be innovative and think of the priorities. And one thing that we did now that borders were closed, there was nothing coming from China, India, where we get our supplies. We had to create our own factories in Kisumu. We started now stitching the masks. First of all, it was home homemade. We came up with the local solutions for our local problems. Uh, at Kimet, we have a vocational training school that was converted into uh, a factory to stitch uh, the masks. Then we went to the communities and started now addressing issues of clean water and how they could get water. And that is why I really value PHC. And I'm happy it is now coming in, in the agenda again, because for a long time, we have been focusing on equipment, constructions, and the rest. But we need to go back to the communities and deal with the basics. Because COVID, as uh, Salim has said, it must have come with challenges. It came with challenges, but we learned a lot. We learned first that our health system is strained, that cannot even um, uh, engage, cannot even cope with the issues that we need to address. We learned that our primary health care system is completely not functional. Because people are used to traveling long distances, 
uh, in search of services. While in UHC, we are talking of improving access, expanding access, but we didn't have this. This is the time we realized that even at the health center level, women cannot deliver there because most of those facilities have not been functional. People take uh, motorbike, motorbike uh, taxis, we call them Boda Boda in Kisumu, and they go a long distance in search of maternity units. So we realized that we need to focus now going forward with UHC. It should be PHC for UHC, as Salim has said. Let's look at the basics. If we want to change our indicators, if we want to change those figures that we are struggling with, I think we need to connect the dots. UHC has been focusing so much on uh, the curative. And Kisumu County, we actually looked at both the demand and the, uh, and the supply. And the focus was so much on the demand, but the supply side was not there. I know people are wondering uh, about the human resource for health. Kenya is also one country that is struggling with the chronic uh, industrial action. The strike, the nurses strike has just ended yesterday, but as we were dealing with the COVID pandemic issues, we were also dealing with the strike and all the facilities were paralyzed. The public sector facilities were paralyzed. So what I would say is one of the issues that we need to address is to make sure that we improve the primary health care facilities. And that will also reduce the traffic that is going to higher level facilities where there's now high uh, uh, congestion and the health workers cannot cope with that. The other policy issue that we dealt with and it was um, a big issue is now the issue of public private partnership. How do we share resources? Maybe there's a private facility nearby, but the pu public facility is closed. How do we share resources in terms of even sharing the supplies when the public sector is not functional due to maybe uh, the strike, the, the, the nurse strike or the doctor strike? So there was a lot to deal with. But lastly, our major priority was to see how now we can ensure that children are immunized and also women deliver at the facility. So we had now to engage uh, the leadership to give a letter to the private sector to allow women to go and deliver there, even those who could not afford, and also uh, give immunizations in those facilities without uh, charging. So basically that is what we did. And uh, I must say that Kisumu County did well because we had a call center and that call center was run by the University of Maseno and it was able to address most of the issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is, um, you know, in incredible testament to a lot of creative solutions, despite at uh, the very beginning of the pandemic, a significant mismatch between the messaging related to preventing COVID and what was actually feasible and possible for many individuals and families that had lost income. Um, so just by localizing, making masks uh, within Kisumu, uh, finding ways for individuals to have jobs, um, and you also pointed to the fact that, you know, in order to make PHC for UHC a reality, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in terms of balancing de demand and supply, significant demand, but not adequate supply. And part of what you talked about as well is the role of the private sector and how you've been able to harness them in delivering some of the key services that are needed when there's been the strikes and challenges within the public sector. So thank you. So we've talked a lot about challenges, but through the challenges, we've also heard some of the solutions which have been put in place to uh, respond to the pandemic and to support primary health care to be resilient. So um, I would like to now ask a quick round of questions to the panelists around some of the solutions, further thoughts that you might have. Starting first with you, Tracy, um, you know, and your thoughts on what 
the COVID-19 pandemic has really taught us about primary health care and maintaining delivery of essential health services and how COVID-19 is going to reshape our understanding uh, and priorities to accelerate primary health care, uh, such as related to task shifting or some of those digital technologies that you talked about at the top of our discussion. Over to you. Uh, um, can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Thank you. Um, so, um, thank you, Kimberly, and, and great presentations and discussions from Salim and, and Monica. Thank you for that. Um, I, I guess, you know, um, out of adversity and, and the um, dreadful pandemic of COVID, I think, you know, if we step back from it um, and all the awful things that have happened, then, then I think there's some, um, some good has, has come out of it. So I think, it, I think there's two or three things I'd like to talk about that, that I think um, are, are positive. Um, and one is that it's taught us to leapfrog technology. So in, in my previous organization, which was very focused on um, AI machine learning and digital technology, um, sometimes it was hard to, uh, to get people to adopt it, to work with insurers or governments. They, you know, they still felt that hands-on care and a doctor with a stethoscope was the only way to deliver healthcare. And, and that's always going to be needed. And there's many times we need that reassuring hand on our shoulder or just to talk to someone face to face. We can never replace that. But I think in COVID, because it was a pandemic, then it's taught us that, that there are different ways of accessing healthcare that, that, that can have good outcomes, um, that can improve um, accessibility. Um, and I think that, you know, what I've seen and when I, you know, I've worked in uh, on the African continent and when I've talked to healthcare providers, what they're saying is that digital tools and innovation takes the friction out of health posts and health centres during COVID. So anyone that had COVID symptoms and say, like you see me where there's call centres or where there's triage centres, then I think you're able to focus care using digital technology and allow health posts, health facilities, health centres to actually focus on those patients that really need hands-on and face-to-face um, -face care. So, so I think, so first of all, it's, it's, it's changed the dialogue and it's changed the discussion because now we can talk about digital healthcare as part of primary healthcare. I think the, the second opportunity for us is building back better. I, I myself and, and my colleagues in the foundation feel really passionate about, you know, this is a moment in time that we don't want to just replace what was there before. Let's really use this opportunity to work in partnership, work together and build back better. And, and for us, building back better means um, using innovation, using new tools, really stretching our thinking, improving accessibility, always focusing on the patient and improving those outcomes. Um, for for individuals and I think that you know finally what I'll say is in the foundation for us what that what that means is that we're focusing on um, six building blocks in terms of what that means and how that's going to help um, to get to that point of, of building back better because we we can't do everything primary health care is an enormous topic as we all know so we need to focus on the things that we can do that make sense for the foundation and the areas that we're looking at focusing in our health financing data, supply chain management, workforce facilities and demand. But each of those pillars, as I described them, will have at the core of them building back better around digital innovation, new tools. Can we mention task sharing? We could talk a lot about that, but we don't have time today. But, but I think, you know, one of the final things I'd say to Monica's point was that you know, what, what innovation can do is the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare providers are always the scarce resource. And I've seen digital platforms improve productivity by 300%. And that's, you know, we, we, can't, we can't increase the supply of doctors and nurses by 300%, but we can actually give them the tools to work more effectively. And actually, what, that's what they all want to do. They want to provide more care, they want to provide better care, and they want to be part of a new way of doing things differently. And for me, the time is now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, that's so well said. It's, it's really about, um, it's not building back the same, uh, but it really is just thinking through what have we learned and how can we do it in a, in a better way that's more effective. And uh, as you say, 
really looks at ways to leverage access to healthcare through digital technologies or through other strategies, um, which is you know, already in place in many, many locations. And as we've heard from Monica with the call centers and so many other approaches. Uh, so uh, Salim, I'd like to turn to you now um, to ask you a little bit about you know, considering all of the tremendous work that's been done in Kenya um, with the many uh, lessons from COVID-19 and before that in very tactically thinking, thinking through how to start primary health care and what all the building blocks are. What do you think some of the lessons are from Kenya and your experiences in primary health care and how you've adapted in COVID that might be interesting for other countries to know or learn about? Over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kimberly. I think one of the main lessons that uh, we learned uh, during uh, this uh, COVID one was the issue that uh, investing or focusing on uh, curative or just the facility was not the right thing. It actually costed us a, a lot in terms of uh, managing the services and also uh, maybe saving lives. Uh, secondly, uh, we also uh, learned uh, that we need to focus in all the building blocks and uh, this needs uh, to put on board the human resource. We need to put on board the commodities. We have to use uh, technology the way it's supposed to be. Otherwise, um, investing in some areas and leaving some areas, uh, for example, in Kenya for a long time, we have not been recruiting or deploying uh, people. Uh, the human resource has been a big shortage in Kenya, but we've been more focused on uh, buying commodities and medicines. So these actually did not help. So we, we really need to focus on all this. Uh, the other thing is that uh, looking at the health system strengthening, and in most of the cases, uh, maybe uh, in, in Kenya, it is just, we look at the facilities, we end at the facility, is actually not the correct thing to do. We really need now to start focusing on the part of the community health system strengthening, looking at PHC, giving it the respect and urgency and importance that it deserves, so that it not looked like a, as a second feudal, uh, something that should come in uh, when there's a problem, when there's a pandemic, when there is a campaign, but it should something that is complementary uh, to the formal health system, if I might call it, but it should be integrated and mainstream. So I think these are things that we really need, we, we learned uh, from this. Uh, the other thing which I alluded to is that technology actually uh, can be uh, both advantageous but also can be very destructive uh, depending on how it is uh, it is used uh, for us uh, there was a big challenge in the media even now as we are planning uh, for the covid vaccine uh, 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 immunization we are already facing a lot of problems in terms of the messaging because already there's a lot of uh, misconception myths of videos in social media that are going around that we need to deal with, uh, with. so i think these are some of the things that we really learned at this uh, point of time but uh, it was also also a good time or a lesson in terms of uh, we could produce documents within uh, weeks uh, to guide uh, the continuity of uh, essential health services that had actually gone down. Uh, we could train uh, people, for example, we trained uh, for us 31,000 community health volunteers uh, using part of it was technology in about two months, and we brought them on board when we were at 65 percent community health units to 97 percent. So uh, we also learned that technology could be very important on bringing on board our uh, health services, our community health uh, volunteers, and also uh, making the services uh, more accessible uh, to the people, despite that there were restriction of movement and uh, the, the protocols of COVID. Thank you. Over. Thank you very much. I think you've very clearly emphasized the importance really of, in a way, just reorienting and rebranding um, primary health care uh, and its value and its importance and really um, balancing out between the curative and primary health care and really all, all of the services and all of the value that an individual can attain through primary health care services. It doesn't require them to travel on a boda boda, you know, miles and miles away to go to a hospital. Um, and then I think as well, just all of the work that you've done quickly with the virtual training of community healthcare workers, not letting COVID stop you, but continuing to develop your workforce, uh, which is fantastic. So Monica, I'd like to turn to you now um, to ask a little bit about what does person-centered integrated primary healthcare mean to individuals, particularly adolescents and youth who have historically faced a number of challenges in accessing health services, uh, including self-care options um, that meet their sexual and reproductive health care needs. 
you know, Salim and Tracy have talked about system-wide uh, vision around integrated primary health care. But how does this translate, uh, you know, to services and support for an adolescent girl in Kissimmee County or in a rural village in Nialenta? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Kimberly, and uh, I'll pick it again from Salim. There's a lot going on, but uh, uh, when we talk about adolescents and youth in Kenya, most of the times we don't involve them. When we are talking about uh, um, people-centered approach, we need to go community. We need to uh, have dialogue with these people and even uh, identify their, their priorities. Uh, to me, what that means is engaging communities and coming up with their priorities. Because right now, as you talk about that uh, rural informal settlement in Kisumu in Yalenda, their priority is water. It's not maybe a new building to be put up there like a health facility and then you buy equipment and put there. So their priority would be the basics that they need to prevent diseases. Basics like menstrual hygiene for an adolescent girl in Yalenda. They don't even have the uh, decent toilets where they can go during schools and all that. So I think uh, for me, the people-centered approach is the way to go. We need to invest in primary health care to address some of the basic needs. Things like water, sanitation, hygiene, because if we start from prevention, we'll be able to see the dividends. We need to uh, a little bit be focused now that primary health care in Kenya is another new wave, just like BPI, we have the Building Bridges Initiative, political wave, but when it's on the health sector, we need also to involve communities and hear what they would like uh, to have and ensure that they are involved in designing, uh, you know, services that meet their needs. As Salim has said, we already have structures. We have community strategy. That is a model. It's beautiful. In Kenya, you can take services up to the household level. I always say the first bed is not in the hostel. It's at the household level, especially during COVID because of the home-based care. The hostel bed number one is at home. So who is actually even educating these communities on how to take care of the COVID uh, positive relatives that they are nursing? So we need to go community. We need to invest on promotion, promoting care, uh, healthcare, preventive healthcare. And I think we have uh, spent a lot of uh, resources in constructions and buying equipment like in Kenya, the first a priority when COVID hit us was to have a bed, a hostel bed capacity of 300, so that in case of any cases uh, that we need to admit, every county was expected to have 300 beds ward capacity. This has not been used. Most of these uh, wards have not been used to date. I just wish that we had put this into the community primary health care and improving those facilities and ensuring that people are involved. Everyone has a role and we really need to uh, bring everybody on board so that we can work together. Also at the community level, we have the networks. We can work with those networks and bring these adolescents and youth on board and involve them, have their voices and ensure that we meet their needs. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. You very clearly talked about, you know, the solutions are really about having primary health care that is focused on health promotion and is really based on what the local needs are um, and is tapping into um, the most, you know, utilizing resources in the best possible way to ensure people within the community are able to access them. And I think, you know, now uh, that we've had a chance to have this conversation, we have a number of questions, which is fantastic. Uh, and one of those questions really has to do with prioritization because primary health care uh, spans the entire uh, lifetime of individuals and includes many different things. And so uh, I would like to ask the panelists really for your thoughts on prioritizing or how we tailor primary health care, just as you were talking about, Monica, 
in different geographies really to best maximize resources. So the question is offered to the three of you uh, and open for any one of you to, um, to start first. I'm happy to go first, um, Kimberly. I, I, I think um, well, there's a couple of things I, I'd like to say is that um, is that um, I think um, uh, we use a lot of terminology. We use primary health care, we use essential health services, and I'm not sure that we do ourselves any favors. And I think that we create confusion. And one of the questions I've been asked most since I joined the foundation is what's the difference between essential health services and primary health care? And actually the, probably, the, the answer is probably nothing. And so I think the first thing is we need to be really clear about our language and what it is what we're trying to do. And then I think we should stay focused. So I've spoken earlier about the six building blocks that we're focusing on in the foundation. We could have had an agenda this wide, but it's really important to focus. So I think it's also good for us as organizations that are all traveling the same direction and wanting to improve integrated um, PHC is that we should be really clear about what those building blocks are. Um, we should work together, both public, private sector, um, with all key stakeholders and really focus on those building blocks, simplify the language, focus on the areas that are going to have most impact. And for me, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this conversation by saying, always put the patient at the heart of that. And are we really moving the needle? Are we really making a difference to those uh, women and men who have poor access to healthcare? And that's where we need to focus. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tracy. So yes, focus, focus on where the greatest impact is. Monica, Salim, did you want to add to this question? There's another question that's come in and uh, this one is focusing in on the private sector and really just your thoughts on the role of the private sector, how the private sector uh, can be an ally uh, in terms of service delivery or other thoughts that you might have with regards to partnering with the private sector. So um, Monica, you mentioned private sector in, in some of your remarks. Uh, do you have some general recommendations around you know, primary health care? What is the role of the private sector? How should the private sector be engaging? Uh, thank you, Kimberly. And, uh, you know, the private sector, especially during uh, the pandemic and the strike in Kenya, is very instrumental. It's actually when there is an emergency, uh, you know, the community does not know which is private or public. They go anywhere. But for us to really uh, make them uh, uh, actively involved, we need to start bringing them on board because most of the times the Minister of Health has focused on the public sector. But right now with the public-private uh, partnership uh, policies that are coming up, this is going to be very helpful because uh, most of the small clinics in the rural uh, communities are private and they are the first stop. So we can share for us to make them more uh, productive and active, actively involved, we can share resources. Resources here includes human resource. Right now in Kenya, our major headache is human resource, but some of these facilities have human resource and they are not very active. How can we make sure that we share that? The other thing is making sure that the insurance like in Kisumu, we have just come up with our Kisumu County Health uh, Insurance Solidarity Fund for the indigents, because these are the people that were always being turned away from, uh, the public, from the private sector. So if the insurance is there and we also assist them and educate them on the need of having uh, national health insurance, which is now going to be mandatory, I think that will really help us because we also must make sure that the private uh, facilities sustain quality services and they can only do that when the clients pay for it. So there's a lot of, there's need for community education for them to appreciate insurance because they have never prioritized insurance. But right now it is the time. And then bringing the private facilities on board and ensuring that at the county level, we have joint engagement 
together and discuss issues together and come up with solutions. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. So bring, we need to bring the private sector in. We need to make it um, easier for them to participate. And as you said, people just need healthcare, you know, whether, whether it's private or public. Um, and you've also talked about health insurance and how to fit and slot private sector services within the health insurance structure. So I'm wondering, uh, Salim, if you have thoughts on that from your perspective on, in terms of governance and working with private sector for primary health care. Yeah, I, I think uh, briefly I will say that uh, as a government now, we are, and especially the ministry, we have come up with a, a PPE uh, policy uh, that we can engage a private uh, uh, sector. In our primary health care networks, actually what we are calling the hub and spoke, the hub we're including actually private uh, level four facilities is not just a government. As uh, Monica said, we need to share the resources in terms of uh, human resource, uh, the equipment, the facility, and what is available. So as a government, actually, currently, we are focusing on how private can come in because uh, we know they play a big role. Even as we are planning for the COVID vaccine, we actually are involving and we're engaging private sector. And uh, with the, we, we are going to have uh, the vaccine that are coming from the government, but we'll also allow uh, the private sector with our condition to bring in vaccines. So I think there's a, a, a great focus on bringing, in bringing on uh, the private sector. Thank you, Ova. Thanks, that's great. Uh, one last question. This has to do with use, the use of technology. So the question really is, you know, how can technology be used to ensure access to primary health care among populations um, that are discriminated against or might be disenfranchised and less able to access health care services? Um, so over to you, Tracy. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think that um, access to technology and digital healthcare actually um, removes quite a lot of smoke and mirrors and makes um, accessibility for hard to reach groups so much better. So certainly, you know, we, we I, I, I've seen um, 20 to 30 percent of the population in Rwanda who would normally have had to walk 20, 10, 20 kilometers to a health post or health center can access healthcare from their home or their, their workplace. Um, I think the other thing uh, probably most powerfully that I saw, and there's often stigma attached to certain um, you know, issues around healthcare, particularly for young people around sexual and reproductive health. And I think on a digital platform and telemedicine platform, it, it can be non-judgmental. Um, I think it, uh, patients feel it's, it's more confidential than having to queue in a corridor and, 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 and wait to see um, a healthcare provider. And then if you require uh, medication and contraception, you can actually do that through e-prescribing and go and collect that from a pharmacy. So, so I think that there's, there's many, many ways for, uh, for um, digital and new technology to actually improve access for even those for, for hard to reach groups, but also for conditions that actually there's often barriers to entry in terms of being able to access good quality care. Thank you, that's great. We are nearly at the end of our discussion. And so what I would like to do is ask for one or two sentences from the three panelists, just really summing up um, the way forward for primary health care uh, from your perspective. So I'd like to start with you, Monica. Thank you, and it was a great uh, discussion. It's just that the time was very short. But I just want to emphasize the need uh, to use technology. We are already piloting that in Western Kenya for telemedicine so that you don't need to refer clients and that will really reduce the unnecessary time spent from the uh, lowest level of facility to the highest level. So they are already connecting the primary healthcare uh, providers with the consultants. Two, we need to use this technology for community data because we need evidence to say that this is actually working. Three, uh, we need to invest. Let's uh, hold our governments accountable to invest on prevention, prevention, prevention. That is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Salim. Uh, I think for me, what I want to emphasize that PHC and future frontier. We got to do without it. COVID has taught us a lesson uh, which should not have been the same. So it is very virgin, and I think we should all uh, we'll put our effort in it, especially our partners. Thank you, over. Thank you, and Tracy. 
Thank you. Um, for me, it's about it's about focus, using a common language, using the six building blocks I, descri I described earlier, and now uh, being really focused and executional and building back better and using all of the tools and resources that are available to us. And finally, doing that together and in partnership. No one can do this on their own. We all need to join together, walk side by side, and we can do some amazing things. Thank you very much. My takeaway from the three of you uh, and all of um, the brilliant experiences uh, and thoughts and advice that you've shared is number one, believe it's possible. Number two, the time is now. And number three, invest and let's do it. So with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, Monica, Tracy, and Celine for being with us over this hour and for all of you who have joined this conversation around primary health care uh, and how we build back better. Uh, I wish you all to uh, be well and stay safe. And thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.